Good evening, and welcome to the 2024 Milton Speaks Candidates Forum. My name is Lawson Bodwin, and I will be tonight's introductory host and moderator for the Select Board Forum. I'm joined by Ms. Elaine Carroll of the Milton Times, and Ms. Cindy Burns, Mr. Kevin Gomes, and Mr. Tucker Corman of the Milton High School debate team. First, some housekeeping. Candidates were contacted through the town's clerk's office as well as MATV for participation in these forums. Candidates were not provided the questions or subject matter before tonight's debate. Tonight's questions will be directed towards all candidates. No individual questions will be asked. Tonight's questions will be asked by members of our press panel. We also solicited questions from the public. If you don't hear your question being asked, it may be part of another question or a repeat question from another panel member. The format for tonight's forum, each candidate will be allowed a 90 second opening statement. Candidates will then be asked questions by members of the panel. Each candidate will be allowed a 90 second response to each question. The order for the first question will be alphabetical by last name with the order changing for each subsequent question. There will be a one minute closing statement offered to each candidate for which the order will be chosen randomly. There will be no rebuttals. I will signal when you have 15 seconds remaining to allow you to wrap up your answer. I ask that you finish your thoughts and bring your response to a close at that time. Please also reference the countdown clock on the TV screen in front of you. Tonight's forum will feature the candidates for select board, school committee, parks commissioner, and planning board. We will begin with our select board candidates. Each candidate was asked to submit a brief bio, which I will read. After their bio, the candidate will read their opening statement. We will now begin introducing our select board candidates. First, Mr. Zulis. Mike Zulis has served the town for the past 14 years on the Warrant Committee, the school committee as a town meeting member and as a member of the select board. A lawyer for nearly 35 years who is managing partner of a 53 lawyer law firm and a former public corruption prosecutor, Mike lives on Fairbanks Road with his wife, Marianne, and their daughters, Melina, who attends Milton High School, and Alyssa, who attends Pierce Middle School. Welcome, Mr. Zulis. You may now read your opening statement. Thank you, Lawson. Thank you to the panel. Thank you to MATV, and thank you all for listening. Um, as Lawson pointed out, I have been involved in various committees and various activities on behalf of the town on the for the last 14 years. And during that time, it has been, and it always will be, my goal to try to find consensus to solve problems for our neighbors. And uh, I've worked um, together with many of our neighbors over the last 14 years to find consensus on many issues. For example, um, on this, uh, we, um, we realized a few years ago that we needed to improve our parks, playgrounds, and open, open spaces. And so I proposed the Community Preservation Act, and we found consensus, and we passed that. On the budget, for 12 of the last 13 years, we found consensus among the select board and the warrant committee and the school committee. And I hope that we do, the, we do that this year as well. I believe we found consensus on the MBTA Communities Act after the election. Uh, consensus that has us uh, aggressively and vigorously defending the case with a top-notch legal team and, try to and trying to preserve the funding from the state. Um, I believe we found consensus on building a new animal shelter. We found consensus on building new broadband. So uh, we've achieved a lot over the last several years by working together, and I'd like to keep doing that for the next three years. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zulis. Next, Mr. Cohane. Mr. Cohane has two grandsons who he loves dearly, who are thriving in the Milton school system. His wife, Kathy, is a special needs teacher and believes that our amazing schools are a major reason we attract young families to Milton. He believes that zoning changes that are being forced upon us will impact our town for years to come. Our neighborhood should have a voice in steering our future in a positive direction. Mr. Cohane cares greatly about our seniors on fixed income. He is sensitive to them as we think about impacts to our budget with possible tax increases. He will soon be in their position as he transitions into retirement. Welcome, Mr. Cohane. You may now read your opening statement. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you um, to the debate team, Milton Access TV, and everybody out there. <clears throat> for those of you who don't know me, my name is John Cohane, and I'm running for select board. I'm here tonight to ask you for your support in giving me the opportunity to represent you on that board. As Sib said, my wife and I are months away from retirement. We love it here and we want to stay here. As a small business owner for 40 years, I understand how to listen to all sides of an issue. I support affordable housing that is scaled and reasonable to promote sustainability and preserve the livability of our town. 
as, as was mentioned, I also have two grandchildren in the school system and I love them dearly. Our problems will take time to resolve, but I'm committed to giving Milton that time. We have great people in town with incredible expertise and varied experiences. I want to utilize them and honor these different voices whenever I can. T together we can draw on our strengths and utilize, create improvements and solutions for the challenges ahead. As a town, we need to work to meet in the middle, pull together. Issues evolve. It is important for our thinking and leadership to evolve as well. Thank you for your time. I look forward to the opportunity to serve you on the Milton Select Board. Thank you, Mr. Cohane. Now, let's begin the forum. The first question will be from Ms. Sydney Burns and will be first for Mr. Zoulis. Thank you. Do you believe traffic is an issue in Milton? If so, what are your plans and ideas for addressing it? Thank you, Sydney. So traffic is a huge issue in Milton. It has been for many years. When I first um, joined the select board, we established what was known as the Traffic Mitigation Committee to try to look at ways that we could improve it. And we solicited a lot of um, uh, resident feedback through public forums and a Wikimax. And what we found was interesting. Um, we found at that time that people were most concerned about safety rather than congestion. They identified the two problems, but they were most concerned about safety. So what we've done and what we, 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 initi we issued about a 50-page report with a lot of recommendations, some of which have been, imp uh, have been implemented, including uh, we, have, uh, we made the Traffic Commission more robust and more responsive to the residents and tried to get the Traffic Commission to work more on a more proactive basis with the neighborhoods. And we've just seen that. Uh, we've seen um, with uh, the neighborhood down by Governor's Road, which is a very dangerous road, we had a neighborhood group work with the Traffic Commission. I worked with them, and we came up with a plan, and we implemented speed bumps to improve traffic there. So there are different pockets and hot spots around town that we identified, and this is really a model. What, what happened on Governor's Road is really a model for the different hot spots around town, Blue Hill Ave, um, uh, Wood Street Extension up on East Milton. It's a, it's a model to have the, um, the residents work with the Traffic Commission to try to come up so, to, with solutions to those problems. It's difficult, the, the big issue in this town is cut through traffic, but we can try to do it neighborhood by neighborhood to improve things. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zoulis. Now, Mr. Cohane, you have the floor. I think we need to think outside of the box because we've really been getting nowhere. We need to learn from others. Boston Safety Surge Program, where they're installing hundreds of speed bumps across the city over the next year, three years. Prior to this, they called it the Whack-A-Mole Program, where they divert traffic from one area and it would pop in another, which describes basically what we've been doing with the do not enter 4 to 6 p.m. or, or, or 7 to 9 a.m. across town. We need to look at this problem townwide and develop a plan together. I also know the person who was the force behind getting the speed bumps on Governor's Road, and I believe that I can deliver that message too. Thank you. Thank you. The next question will be from Ms. Elaine Carroll and will be first for Mr. Cohane. Please explain your current thinking on the MBTA Communities Act and its compliance as it relates to the town. What will your role be as a select board member? Well, <clears throat> I've heard it said not to worry about the implications of the by right multifamily zoning mandated by the MBTA Act. It won't happen all at once, but it's clear at some point when it does do what it was designed to do, it'll bring 2,500 homes and the school children and traffic to go with it. We need to be thinking ahead and consider it for what it will be. And there could be one called affirmative affirmatively furthering fair housing coming out of the federal level that I read about today that adds more urgency to our cause. Here's what I'm committed to. It's clear that we must fight for reclassification. Make this a truly affordable housing plan and increase the percentage of affordable units to a minimum 15% mandatory for all buy right for all units built under this act by requiring con contribution to the trust funds for those lower unit quantity homes. Also require them to keep affordable for the life of the building, not to expire after so many years as 40B does. This act hasn't even spelled that out yet. This problem could come back worse. Thank you, Mr. Cohane. Mr. Zoulis, you have the floor. 
Thank you, Lawson. Thank you, Elaine. Um, so the goal of the select board uh, for the next several months, probably for the balance of the year, is to oversee the litigation with the Attorney General's office. That's first. Um, and what I did after the, um, after the election and after the town was sued was to try to find the best legal talent we could to represent the town. We have a top-notch team in place to represent the town. Uh, we have responded to the Attorney General's lawsuit in the most vigorous way possible and raised all the issues. Um, that will uh, run its course over the next several months. There'll be a briefing schedule and then there'll be an oral argument in October and the court will issue a decision sometime after that. Um, in, in addition to that, um, one of the most important things that, that I'm trying to do is to try to postpone the withdrawal of funding and try to make the argument to the governor's office and to the agencies and to the uh, transportation funding agencies, as, uh, organizations as well, that we need to postpone the withdrawal of funding at, at, until after the decision by the court. Even the attorney general has asked for the, the uh, remedy to be imposed three months after the decision by the court. So it seems to me that it's reasonable to ask the executive branch and all of those agencies to postpone any withdrawal of funding. So that's the other main thing that we need to do. So we need to oversee the litigation. We need to postpone the withdrawal of funding. And the other idea I had was to try to bring together former select board members and planning board members to try to find some consensus on some of the issues. And we'll see if that, that happens as well. Next question will be for Mr. Kevin Gomes, and will be first for Mr. Zulis. Thank you. Do you agree with the select board's approval of the grant bid to boost the Milton Fire Department staffing? And if not, should such grants be utilized elsewhere? Um, so, so I, uh, you're talking about the safer grant, the federal safer grant. Yes, I, I did vote in favor of that. I do support it. That's going to allow us to uh, to hire five additional firefighters. And that's what we need in this town. We need five additional firefighters. Um, the time period for that grant is, I believe, three years. Uh, and the, the SAFER grant will fund the firefighters, those five positions, for three years. And then after that, in order to maintain it and not have to pay that money back, we'll have to hire those firefighters. And so it is a need in the town. We do need the firefighters. And we need to plan budget-wise over the next three years how we'll hire them uh, within our operational budget, budget so we don't have to pay back the SAFER grant. So I, I fully support the SAFER grant. I think um, it's, uh, it's long needed, long overdue for our fire firefighters. They've been down in terms, of, in terms of their staffing for a while. They need to, they have, they, we need additional staffing on one of our ladder trucks. So it's gonna provide important staffing for our firefighter, for our, for our firefighters and for our fire service in town. And, um, and then the role of government, the role of town government and the select board is going to be over the next three years um, d coming up with a plan to fund that when the safer grant times out in, th in that three year period. Thank you, Mr. Zulis. Mr. Cohane, you have the floor. I, I believe that anything we can do to support our town services is a must. Uh, we have talented people. We need to do whatever we can to support them. We need to let them know that we support them in ev every way we can. And that is something I will continue to do. Thank you both. The next question will be from Ms. Elaine Carroll and will be first for Mr. Cohane. Would you be likely to support an override for the town and school budget for the fiscal year 2026? What would sway your decision? Could you repeat that? I didn't hear. Would you be likely <clears throat> to support an override for the town and school budget for fiscal year 2026, so a year from now? What would sway your decision? I think the most important thing that I can do in that regard is try to build a consensus and find a common ground from everybody because we all have differing needs and we have to somehow come together because schools are critical. Um, they won't make a town. Um, someone mentioned to me and I, I, it struck me that while my kids, well, I was younger and my kids were in school, people supported us even though their children weren't in the schools. And I think we need to, all of us need to keep that in mind, that, that we, we need to support the children, we need to support the schools. And I believe that's one of the things I hope to do is to try to bring some consensus on that and bring people together. Thank you, Mr. Cohane. Mr. Zulis, you have the floor. Thank you, 
us, and thank you, Elaine. So um, I've been working on these budgets for 13 out of the last 14 years, and for 12 of those 13 years, we have found consensus with the Select Board and the Warrant Committee and the School Committee. No easy task, and uh, I'm hopeful that we'll find that again this year. Um, the budget changes every year. Uh, I thought we were going to need an, uh, an override this year. The reason we didn't need an override is because we've been very well managed and we were able to pay off our retirement fund liability two years early. And that was something we've been talking about since I was on the Warrant Committee back in 2012. When 2027 seemed like a long time away, we paid it off two years early. We were able to save $2.5 million from our operational budget and we had $6 million in free cash. Again, not expected, so that allowed us to balance the budget this year. The goal is always to balance the budget, in my view, balance the budget and get a consensus among those three groups to go to town meeting. Um, I hesitate, we may well need an override next year, but uh, I wanna get through this year. I wanna see how things start to shake out in the fall. That's how you always try to decide it. And things come up every year. We've always been able to cobble, cobble it together. Uh, the, the 13 years, uh, there was one year I wasn't involved in town government in 2017. That was the one year there was an override. Every year I've been involved, we've been able to figure it out. Uh, so we'll see what happens next year. We'll see if there are any surprises, good surprises next year. But, um, but uh, so, I'll, so I would say I would be swayed if, if our residents need the services and aren't getting the services that they need, that would sway me to support an override. Thank you both. The next question will be from Tucker Corman and will be first for Mr. Zulis. Thank you, Lawson. As the plate restaurant next to the fruit center closes and a sit-down restaurant opens in its place, do you believe there is a need for Milton to focus on attracting formal restaurants or should the dining focus be elsewhere? That's a good question. Um, uh, I, I, so this, is, this gets into, a, a, I guess, a personal question. Uh, I, um, I, um, we have some very good establishments uh, up in East Milton. We have Novara, we have Abbey Park, this will be another one. So we have some very good establishments up uh, in, in East Milton. We have some very, down, uh, very good establishments down in uh, Milton Village with the Steel and Rye. Um, and uh, I guess, uh, personally, I, I would like something more casual along the, uh, along the lines of a cafe. Uh, and uh, so I, I, I guess I would say that, that I think for our size of town, we have uh, good choices for formal restaurants, particularly with this new, new one coming online. Uh, and something a little bit more casual might be, uh, might be more preferred. Um, um, but uh, I haven't done the analysis, but just my sense of it is we have a good, we have a good mix of formal establishments at this point. So, um, but that's a really good question. Thank you for it, Tucker. Thank you, Mr. Zulis. Mr. Cohane, you have the floor. Would you repeat that for me, please? Yeah, absolutely. As the plate restaurant next to the fruit center closes and a sit-down restaurant opens in its place, do you believe there's a need for Milton to focus on attracting formal restaurants or should the dining focus be elsewhere? A difficult one for me because I know the owners personally and it's a tough, tough decision. I have I've run my own business. I, I understand what it's like to struggle and I feel I feel more compelled to support the small businesses in whatever way we can. Um, we have plenty of variety of types. Um, my feeling is mostly with the smaller businesses and that's where I would, my support would be. Thank you. Thank you both. The last question will be from Ms. Elaine Carroll and will be first for Mr. Cohane. How can the board increase communication, cooperation and transparency with other boards and residents? That's a great question, because that's a question I have for myself going into this. That's the first thing I wanna do. The, these uh, 20 minute public speak periods before meetings is just not enough. Um, I, I, find, I feel we have to get out to the people. I've tried, it's difficult to get people to, people are busy. It's difficult to get them to come to meetings but I am figuring it out, to be honest with you, but somehow we have to figure out a way to get feedback from the people to find out how they really feel about all of these issues. I, and and I, I, the, the word's been used a lot, but consensus, we have to come together and discuss all these things reasonably, calmly, and figure out a way to move forward. And that is what I'm going to do. 
get together with as many people as I can. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. Mr. Zulis, you have the floor. Thank you, Lawson. Well, Elena, I think we've done a lot over the last seven, several years to try to bring the information to the public through our website, through our meetings. Uh, I agree that, uh, and I mentioned at our last meeting, that we should, we should try to uh, increase our public comment. The balance there is the board can only work and act in those public meetings. So the balance is you need to do your work, but you also want to hear uh, from the residents. So I suggested, well, going forward, we might have um, one meeting every quarter, a month devoted just to public comment, just for an hour or so, so we could hear from the residents. Um, the other thing that, that I try to do, and, and John mentioned it, but I've, I've been trying to do over the last six years, just go out and meet the residents. You know, if there's an issue on, on Governor's Road, go meet them. If there's, an, if there's an issue in East Milton, go meet the residents. If there's an issue uh, down in Milton Vis Village, go meet the residents. So, so uh, my effort has been to, to really to go out and, and talk to the residents and meet with the residents, and because that's really where you, you get it. That's really where you get the feedback. And, and you know, whether you're going to, to specific areas around town, or going to the schools, or going to the library, or going to town hall, that's really the way you do it, is to, to, to go out and, and uh, find out what's going on in the community. But it's always a challenge um, because, um, uh, you know, as much as you try, uh, people have busy lives and they have things that they're doing that take them away from what you think is important. So it's a challenge, but we, we keep trying to do our best. Thank you both. We will now hear the closing statements from our candidates chosen at random. Each candidate will have 60 seconds. First is Mr. Cohane, followed by Mr. Zulis. Mr. Cohane, you may now begin. It's difficult for me, but at this stage of the game during the campaign, I have to point out my differences and that can be somewhat confrontational, and it's not what I am about in this election. I'm about consensus, friendship, working together. That said, I've heard an awful lot from Mike, who has done great things for this town about consensus building, but that's not what I've seen over the last few months, especially with the MBTA Act, an issue he's been very divisive going so far as using words like cleansing to talk about no voters, I being one of them. It's what brings me here tonight, asking for your vote, because it's clear that it's time for a change in leadership, and my strength is working together. In fact, I am still great friends with a sp strong supporter, a strong yes supporter to this day. That is me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. And now, Mr. Zulis. Thank you, Lawson. Thank you um, to the panel, and thank you, everyone, for listening. It has been my great honor to work on behalf of our neighbors uh, over the last 14 years. Uh, my view of town government is very simple. It's about trying to solve problems uh, for our neighbors. There's no um, agenda. There's no ideology. It's just about trying to solve problems. Uh, you, when the fire stations are too old, how do you solve the problem? When traffic on Governor's Road is bad, how do you solve the problem? Um, on um, when the schools are, are overcrowded. How do you solve the problem? That's what drives me, and that's what I try to do every day. And, um, you know, the MBTA communities uh, uh, issue, uh, I think we have consensus on that. I have a lot of um, uh, people who were disagreed with me on that issue who are supporting my campaign. My number one contributor uh, is a was a supporter of the No campaign, and now he's supporting me uh, because we have consensus on how to move forward on that. So that's what I've been trying to do for the last 14 years years, and I'm going to continue to try to do that if I have another three years. Thank you very much. Thank you to all our select board candidates, and good luck on April 30th. Audience, please stay tuned while we set up for the school committee candidates. Hello, I am Sydney Burns and I will be your moderator for the school committee. We will now hear from the candidates for the school committee who are incumbent Dr. Elizabeth Carroll and new candidates Mr. Dan O'Neill and Ms. Amanda Sirio. We will begin with Dr. Carroll. Dr. Elizabeth Carroll, Carroll is the current chair of the Milton School Committee. A former teacher and experienced leader across education sectors, Lizzie's most important role is being the mom of two daughters who are in fourth and first grades at Tucker Elementary School. Welcome, Dr. Carroll. You may now read your opening statement. Thank you so much, Sydney. 
Um, and thank you to Milton Access TV for hosting this really important forum, the opportunity for our community to get informed about what's at stake in this election and what our options are for moving forward as a town. Um, I also want to thank Milton Access for working with me over this past year um, to enable our school committee meetings to become fully hybrid. It, uh, for a while, it seemed that wouldn't be possible, but uh, that's one way that we've tried to increase our access for the community to the work of the school committee. I want to thank Elaine and the work of the Milton Times as well to keep our residents informed. And these great students, um, our high school debaters, thanks for participating in this process. Um, your civic engagement is really inspiring. And it's so important that young, young people's voices in our community are heard. Um, that's something we've been working on the school committee as well with some of you. So I'm running for re-election to ensure that we seize this moment of opportunity for the Milton Public Schools. Last year, we undertook a process with a lot of community input to hire a new superintendent, um, and he was to lead us into the future. Uh, we've been seeing this year that the person we selected, Dr. Peter Burroughs, has indeed brought the skills and the vision to help us realize our goals as a district. I've spent the last three years getting us to this point. We have now identified priorities, again, through a process of community input from families, students, and staff that represent a roadmap to becoming the district where every child can thrive. And so the question now is, will we follow this roadmap? And my proven leadership will help us maintain our positive momentum to see this through. So that's why I'm running, um, to ensure that we keep building on our strengths and become the district all our kids deserve. Thanks. Thank you. Next, Mr. O'Neill. Dan O'Neill and his wife have, have, three, oh, yeah, have three children that are enrolled in the Milton Public Schools. The O'Neill family has lived in Milton for the past 14 years. Dan coached Milton Youth Soccer for six years and was the past president of United We Stand for Jason, a charity set up to find a cure for Huntington's disease. Dan is a forensic accountant by profession and, if elected, he will bring a unique financial perspective to the Milton School Committee. Welcome, Mr. O'Neill. You may now read your opening statement. Thank you, Sydney. Thank you, panel. Thank you, uh, Milton Access TV, and the people in the audience, and the people at home. Um, I'm running for one of the two uh, open seats on the school committee because I think that I can uh, be the best candidate here uh, to earn your vote because, as you'll see during this uh, forum, I am not an educator. I am not from the education field. I'm not from the nonprofit field. I'm from the numbers field. I'm a forensic accountant by trade. I have worked over 28 years uh, doing uh, forensic audits on school districts, on governmental agencies, and on municipalities themse themselves. I've worked on teams that have ret returned tens and tens of millions of dollars back to the Commonwealth, back to towns who uh, have been taken advantage of by 40B developers. Um, so with that unique set of skills, you'll see that my candidacy is gonna offer the school board um, a different voice, a, a voice that uh, comes from um, the finance field. I think that the school department uh, should be run like a business. Um, so with your, with your vote, um, you can make that happen for the, for the Milton School Committee, and I thank you for uh, allowing me this opportunity. Thanks. And now we welcome Miss Sirio. Miss Sirio and her husband Steve have lived in Milton since 2004, and they have three boys who have all attended Milton Public Schools. She is a special education advocate by profession and has volunteered in the community for many years, including serving as a chair of the SEPAC and a co-founder of Milton Sports for All. For the past two years, she has been a member of the Warrant Committee and served on the School Budget Subcommittee. Welcome, Ms. Sirio. You may now read your opening statement. Thank you, and thank you for having us. I appreciate it. Um, yes, my name is Amanda Sirio, and I am the proud mom of three boys, one of whom has special needs. And I've been involved in the Milton special education community for about 13 years since um, my son was at the integrated preschool. And as you mentioned, I have um, been a member of the Milton Special Education Parents Advisory Council for three years, and I'm a co-founder of Milton Sports for All, which is a parent-run, very fun, inclusive uh, rec league. And as you mentioned, I've been on the Warrant Committee and the School Budget Subcommittee for two years. I feel like this gives me um, a unique set of experience to bring to the school committee. 
um, in my role as a special education advocate, I've had the opportunity of working with kids with diverse learning and social and emotional needs. And in that capacity, I've been able to see how the right curriculum and the resources can support the growth and development of all students, which I think is very important. Uh, in my role on the school, um, sorry, in the Warren Committee, I've been, um, I've, I've been able to see how the town finances work and recognize the real, very real challenges that we have in financing our schools and our town services. So if I elected to school committee, I'll put my passion towards two things. I'll work on building an inclusive school that, is support, uh, that supports the success of all students, and I will advocate for the school budget, and I will recognize the importance of balancing the financial needs of the schools and our town. Thank you. Thank you. Now, let's begin with the forum. The first question will be from Mr. Lawson Bodwin, and will be first for Dr. Carroll. Some examples to deal with the overcrowding issues in Milton schools include renovating the top floor of Cunningham and building a seven to eight middle school. How do you plan to deal with overcrowding in the school system? Dr. Carroll, you have the floor. Okay, thank you so much for starting out with that really important question. Um, so you've just mentioned off the top a couple of the things that we've been hard at work to plan for. Um, we need a new school. We have a severe overcrowding problem in Milton Public Schools. Anyone who has been in our schools knows this. Uh, we have classrooms in libraries. We have um, teachers making photocopies in hallways. Our class sizes are beyond what are recommended ratios. Um, this is a really important problem to address because we cannot become a district of excellence for all of our students without solving this problem. So we've been working, as you mentioned, on short-term solutions this year. Um, the plans to renovate the fourth floor of the Cunningham, I'm really proud of the work, the consensus building and the planning that has taken place this year, led by our facility subcommittee um, and then Myself, uh, representing the school committee on our capital planning improvement committee, has you know, worked with the town to get to the place where, at this point, we're relying on town meetings approval to move that important project forward. That's something that had been talked about for years and people said we wouldn't be able to do it. We are moving forward to do that important project, but ultimately that is a Band-Aid solution and we do need to build a new school as quickly as possible so that as many families as possible will be able to benefit from that. So that is something that I fully support and will continue to work on. Thank, Thank you. you. Next, Mr. O'Neill, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, I ran for school committee last year and one of the suggestions that I made was that uh, in order to uh, alleviate the crowding of the schools is we should uh, go up and or out uh, for a temporary fix of the, of the overcrowding issue. Um, I'm glad to see that uh, the, the school department in, in the town is taking heed uh, of, of that advice and they're, they're going up uh, and renovate the third floor on, of the Cunningham School. The overcrowding issue, uh, everybody knows that it's, it's critical right now and that we do need a new school. And if elected, I will be doing everything in my, my power to make sure that that uh, school is built. Um, but in the, in the immediate, uh, we really need to start rescheduling classrooms uh, uh, rotations uh, on, on all the el elementary schools and trying to find sp spaces that are underutilized during the day. I, I know that they're stretching it to the limit, but th there's got to be uh, more of a concentrated effort on, on maybe extending the school day uh, or making the school day a little bit earlier for some classes. Um, I also think that there should be a, a big effort uh, going towards uh, engaging Milton Academy and also Curry College in order to try to find whether or not there is school uh, classrooms that are not being used by the college and, and working with our, 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 our other academic institutions to find uh, a solution for the, for, this, for the short term. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Ms. Serio, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, I think like the other two candidates, I fully support building a new school and I think the sooner that we do it, the better. Um, I know that plans are already underway or they're, they're initiation underway for the new school and I think that um, 
some of the th work that I've seen, um, timelines before that were seven years or much shorter than that, probably in line of three, you know, probably three years, which I think is important. I think the work that's being done at Cunningham as well is needed, adding a third floor. Um, I, I, I would, I understand the need for looking at other spaces outside of the school areas, but I think that that would provide, present real challenges with respect to transporting to students. How do you make sure that it's inclusive so that special education students are still with the gen ed students? So I think finding ways to um, take advantage of the space that we have, but it, I do feel like all of the opportunities have been explored and that the real opportunity is for the new school as soon as possible and the building out of the third floor at Cunningham. Thank you. Thank you. The next question will be for Ms. Elaine Carroll and will be first for Mr. O'Neill. How do the goals of diversity, equity, and inclusion fit with those of academic excellence in your view? Mr. O'Neill, you have the floor. Thank you, Elaine, for that important question. Diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, um, I, I, I believe is, is um, a program that is, is needed in this school. But it's a program that needs to be uh, analyzed and there has to be data that is derived from how students are being um, taught, wh what they're being taught, what is uh, the outcome of uh, the programs, uh, is the, the students that need uh, uh, mental uh, behavioral services, are, are they being provided with those services? And uh, is there data being measured in order to improve upon those services? I don't see any of that in the school, the school system. Um, the belonging aspect of it and the inclusion aspect you'll hear from, from the panel is, is super important, especially to me. My son George has, uh, has autism and uh, navigating through that, uh, the special ed uh, system for myself and my wife was a daunting task. It, it gets so bad that you have to hire a specialist like Amanda to advocate for your family. That is unacceptable. Uh, the special education program, th there was a, a review done last year and, and it, it, it was eye-opening to me about the confusion, the secretness of services, the programs, and the, the ability for the, for the school department uh, to explain all services in order to have diversity and equity be um, uh, lifted up, you first have to know what programs there are and, and measure the outcomes to improve them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. Next, Ms. Syria. Thank you. Um, I believe um, strongly in DEI. Um, I think you'll find that that's the basis of the civil rights movement as well as the disability rights movement. It's been an important foundation that, that students with disability and students of color are recognized and that they're treated equitably and they're included in our community. And I think until people feel valued and included, they're not able to access the curriculum. They're not able to access academics. And so you can have academic excellence or you can have, de you, you need both. You need both DEI to have academic excellence because I think that you really need for students to feel safe, secure, and supported in order to access the curriculum and really take advantage of the academics that, that are presented to them. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Carroll, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, so yes, it's a really important question. Um, we, we are really blessed to live in such a diverse town um, with so many vibrant communities represented. And this to me is one of the most special things about Milton. Um, it's one of the reasons my family loves to live here. Um, investing in DEIB is not something we do for its own sake. It's not actually, it's not actually a program or a set of programs, um, but it is an approach to all the important work we do um, which ultimately is all to serve the purpose of academic excellence so that each child who attends Milton Public Schools is able to reach their full potential, to thrive, um, to do well in school and to be happy doing well in school. So um, the goals of DEI fit with academic excellence in that they're a means to an end. Um, I think about uh, the initiatives that we've undertaken over the past few years um, you know, whether we're trying to um, support our English language learners. Uh, we've seen a 71% increase in English language learners over the past five years. 
uh, we need to be adding capacity to support those students and ensure that they have that sense of belonging here. Um, you know, the, the point of all of it is for our students to do well um, in school, to do the best that they can. Um, and a child cannot learn their best if they don't feel safe, if they don't feel seen, um, if they don't feel supported. Um, so there are a lot of things that we're doing to achieve that goal. Um, and it, it ultimately is all about um, achieving academic excellence for all of our kids, every single one, regardless of um, their identity. So thanks for the question. Thank you. The next question will be for Mr. Kevin Gomes and will be first for Ms. Syria. Thank you. How would you, as the member of the school committee, help balance the curriculum based on the organizational needs and wants of teachers, administrator, administrators, students, and parents? Could you repeat that? I'm sorry. Yeah. How would you, as the member of the school committee, help balance the curriculum based on the organizational needs and wants of teachers, administrators, students, and parents? Thank you. Um, I think one of the things that um, in reading the superintendent's priority report that came through clearly was the issue of curriculum and the importance of it to the students and to the parents and the need for improvement. I think we also saw that there are a number of, of teachers who find that um, they have priorities or challenges um, in that sometimes may feel inequitable. So some may feel that they have a lot of students who have accommodations that they have to take care of and others that, it might, that they might not have as many of that. And so I think that it's important um, to find a curriculum or balance a curriculum that is accessible to all, but it allows for, um, it allows for those who require a more rigorous curriculum to have access to that, but to those who need a more modified curriculum to have access to that, and for the teachers and administrators to all be trained on the same curriculum. I think using various curriculum doesn't allow for measurement of progress of students. It doesn't allow for collaboration of teachers on the best ways of teaching the curriculum. So I think, um, I think it's important to have a curriculum that is flexible, um, but consistent across the district so that parents, students, and administrators all know what to expect. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, Dr. Carroll. Dr. Carroll, you have the floor. Thank you so much. So I agree with Amanda that we have a lot of really great um, direction in, a, in the superintendent's priority report to help us answer this question. Um, it's really important to balance, as you said, the needs of the teachers, students, and parents um, through a number of the things that we have in place. We have curriculum review cycles in place. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago at a school committee meeting, we were hearing about the status of our literacy curriculum, um, which is under review, and there are a number of creative things happening there to um, integrate several different sources of curriculum to meet the needs of students. Um, we have a multi-tiered system of supports, which is being put in place to ensure that students receive both the challenge and the support that they need. Uh, these are all areas we've identified to kind of continue improving, and that work is underway. Um, professional development and is another really important area. Teachers, when we are updating our curriculum, require professional development to have the support to you know, make changes to their practice. So that's another area that we've identified. Um, but my most important point on this probably is, um, and I've learned this through serving on school committee, C school committee members do not actually make decisions about curriculum. Uh, the superintendent leads that work with the, the leadership team. We have curriculum directors who oversee that work. The key is, do you have a superintendent in place who's a solid leader of that work? And we now do, and that's, that is the, jo the job of the school committee. So, um, you know, we're, we're on the way, we're making progress in those areas. Thank you very much. Up next, Mr. O'Neill. Mr. O'Neill, you have the floor. Thank you. Can I get the question again? How would you, as the, member of a school, as the member of a school committee, help balance the curriculum based on the organizational needs and wants of teachers, administrators, students, and parents? Okay, thank you very much. So as I said before, not a teacher, not, a, not involved in education, uh, but I am involved in numbers, okay? The curriculum, I'm gonna leave it to the professionals, okay? But what really uh, has occurred since 2020 is the budget. 
The budget has uh, not been um, managed correctly in terms of forecasting what funds are available to provide the necessary teachers, the necessary behavioral uh, interventionalists, as well as the, the math and, and the reading uh, interventionalists. That, that's a failure of, of the school committee. That's a failure of, of uh, my candidate here uh, to the right and also from my candidate here to the left. She was on the Warren Committee. The, the, the warning should have been so, uh, signaled years ago that these ARPA funds and the ESSER funds were gonna run out. They were not, they were a temporary measure to address the needs uh, of the children in need so that they can get over the, you know, the COVID. That didn't happen. The, there was a lack of foresight, as I said. You're relying upon administrators that don't have the, uh, the financial background or the forecasting ability that is driven by data to help make the decisions on uh, what is needed for the parents and what the parents need. They need uh, the right teachers to be hired and, and the, the right uh, interventionalists to be hired to, to close that learning gap. And that was not done. Thank you. Thank you. The next question will be for Ms. Elaine Carroll, and will be first for Dr. Carroll. Uh, it's a little repetitive, but do you support the recommendation to construct an additional school on Guile Road? Please explain why or why not. Dr. Carroll, you have the floor. Yes, I wholeheartedly support that recommendation to build a new school on the Guile Road, and I'm really excited um, about the plans that are underway. Uh, just, I think it was last week, uh, we had the school building committee chair, um, Shauna Work, come and sh provide updates around, um, you know, the fact that we have now an architect who's beginning uh, with the school building committee to uh, put put some ideas to paper, um, and it's exciting to begin to see that. Um, you know, we um, we just recently resubmitted another um, funding request to um, the Mass School Building Authority. We're covering our bases. Uh, we're also, you know, understanding that next year, next fall potentially, uh, we as a community might have the opportunity to decide whether we support the building of that school. Um, so this is going to be a topic of much discussion in the, in the months and years ahead. Um, as far as the role for the school committee, since it's the school building committee that is actively engaged in moving forward the process of the building itself, the school committee over these next couple of years is gonna be doing really important work designing the educational program for this building to ensure that it will meet the needs of our students and our teachers. Uh, rather than, you know, we end up just putting a program in based on a building that was built, um, you know, without the consideration. So that's the role of the school committee in the next year to two years. A really important job where you do need education perspectives um, to inform, you know, how you design that program, make sure it will be meeting our needs. But yes, we need that school yesterday. Thank you. Up next, Mr. O'Neill. Mr. O'Neill, you have the floor. Thank you very much for that important question. I think that all three of us are in agreement that a new school needs to be bu built. But again, here we go, finance, how are we gonna pay for this? Uh, the School Building Authority uh, back in uh, 2006, uh, they refurbished and, and they funded uh, the, the revitalization of every school in, in this town. And now, uh, less than, you know, 15 years later, we're, we're coming back and we're gonna ask again for funding. And we've already been rejected three times. Um, so how are we gonna pay for it? That's the question. That's what we, we gotta ask the senior citizens, the homeowners, um, the, 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 all the stakeholders here, the, the town officials uh, that on, on the select board, how do we pay for this school? Um, if, you, if you thought that an operational override uh, is coming next year, you're right, a as well as a, as a general override for the town. So there's gotta be some, um, some, some critical thought here on where are we gonna get the funding for this school, especially if we're denied again from the School Building Authority? If you want my expertise on this school board, you want the, uh, the experience that I bring, you're gonna vote for me because I, I, I'll, I'll do everything I can in my power to make sure that it's done correctly, it's built on time, and, it, and, it's, and it's done correctly. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. Up next, Ms. Sirio. Ms. Sirio, you have the floor. Um, thank you, and like everybody else, I think we've stated that, that we fully support, or I fully support the building of a new school. Um, somebody said a couple of years ago when I was watching a presentation, they said that you fund what you value. And I think that we all value the new school. We value a space for students where they can learn. Um, I believe that it, one of the advantages of having a new school um, would be the ability to start looking at bringing some of the students who are in special education back into the district. We currently have 62 students, including my son, who goes to school out of district. It's, it's an expensive venture. It probably costs on average $100,000 per student to be out of district. So that's a lot of money. And I'm not saying it for the financial reasons. I'm saying it for the community reasons. Our kids deserve to be in our schools but we don't have the space to bring them back. Even if we had the programs, there's no space to bring them back. So I think that that's very important as we look at this. Um, uh, Dan is right that we have been turned down. I think the fact that we got funding in 06 is the reason that there are a number of towns and cities that haven't been funded. But part of the difficulty in receiving that funding is that you have to build to the demographic projections that they offer at that time. And so, the reason that we are in the situation we are is that you couldn't look outward. You couldn't look as far outward as we needed to, and now we've had substantial growth and we have approximately 480 new units of housing coming in that we need to accommodate for because that will include students. So I think for all of those reasons, the growth and the desire to bring back our kids in, that are out of district, I fully support a new school. Thank you. Thank you. The next question will be from Mr. Tucker Quarman and will first and will be first for Mr. O'Neill. Thank you, Sydney. <clears throat> Beyond overcrowding, what do you believe is the most pressing issue facing the school committee? What schools does it involve, and what are some possible solutions? Mr. O'Neill, you have the floor. Thank you, Tucker. Um, the most sin significant issue that's facing the school system, is obviously, is funding. Um, and, and I talked about that in my former answers, and, and I'll just go, the, the program that is sorely underfunded and um, is near and dear to my heart is the special education um, uh, programs that are sorely underfunded and are, uh, and are sorely needed by our, uh, our, not only the special ed children, but also the, the, the students that are on individual education plans. The number of students that are, are on IEP um, went from 500 to 774 students just this year. That, that, that program takes up 18% of our budget, but the numbers have exploded. And again, the, the budgeting uh, lack of foresight um, from the school department, the school officials here, they're, they're not thinking in the future, they're thinking now. They, they almost get to a point where they're relying on one or two people to make uh, a budget up and they're not really critically thinking about the uh, ramifications of what the, the line items are in this budget in order to make these programs uh, successful. They're not measuring it either. So the special education um, uh, ha had a review that was done and I encourage everybody to read it. It's about 100 pages. It is, it is eye opening. So th that would be my priority. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. Up next, Ms. Sirio. Um, <clears throat> thanks for the question. I, I will agree in concept with Dan about the most pressing need, and that would, I would agree, would be um, special education. But I think that I would take a different tact, and I wouldn't necessarily say that it's underfunded. I would say that it's underexplored. I think that what we need to do is look at all of our programs across all of the schools and see what the needs are. So what is the student population in special education? It's changed a lot. You know, how do we begin to address the needs of students with learning needs? Dyslexia has grown substantially. We don't have the programs for it. We don't have consistent programs across the schools. Parents aren't aware of what the trajectory is for their students. So if you start in the elementary school, what does that program look like in the middle school and then the high school? And so I think by looking at it from a holistic standpoint, that then you would understand what programs and services that we need and then fund appropriately. It may find savings in doing that. Right now, that's very scattered. It may, again, have the ability to bring students back and save money. And I think this, and I think it may also have the opportunity for more inclusion. Do 
do we find ways to have the French immersion program more inclusive? Are there special education teachers that we could put in there? Is there learning professional development that could be done so that we can have um, our students have access to more classes? So to Dan's point, that was a, a, an extremely informative study that was done and I highly recommend people do it, but I do think that, that looking at that program across the district um, could have a substantial impact across all schools. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Sirio. Up next, Dr. Carroll. Dr. Carroll, you have the floor. Thank you. So I will build on what Dan and Amanda were speaking about in terms of um, our special education program. Um, I definitely agree that the report, the um, audit that was conducted last spring is a really important resource for us to um, chart our path forward. And that is what our Director of Student Services has been doing this year. Um, our superintendent, as I mentioned, has created a priority report, which similarly clarifies really detailed uh, plans for how we are going to address uh, gaps, both for special education as well as general education. And that leads me to you know, the issue that I see. It's a multifaceted issue. It encompasses special education, but it's really the larger issue of the opportunity gaps that still exist in Milton Public Schools. Um, all of our students need to be both challenged and supported to thrive. And I think we all agree on that, um, but we need to actually complete the work of um, closing those gaps. We've made progress. We've seen growth in many areas, most notably in science, for example. Um, we need to, as Dan was saying, um, follow our data. And that is something that we have, um, that we have been trying to do. Uh, we have identified where we need additional intervention support. We've added those staffing positions over the past couple of years. I'm still working on how we will be able to see that through for next year's budget, um, which, is, which is a work in progress. Um, but you know, again, it's about how are we improving our curriculum, our professional development, um, and how are we kind of doing all of that in a coherent manner um, so that we can be a place where your race, your socioeconomic status, your English language learner status, or whether or not you receive special education services, that doesn't define your success. Thank you. The last question will be for Mr. Lawson Bodwin, and will be first for Ms. Syria. Given that, due to the town being sued over zoning, the school committee has a smaller budget to work with next year. What are some non-negotiables for you in terms of funding? What are some areas you'd be willing to compromise on? Um, thank you for the question. Um, I don't think it will come as any surprise at this point that some of the non-negotiables for me would be around special education. But I would actually say too that it's not just special education. I would say learning specialists, some of the math interventionists, and the adjustment counselors. <clears throat> because I believe that those would support our students on IEPs, but also prevent students from getting onto IEPs because we could get those interventions done earlier for those students. So that would be the non-negotiable. Um, for me, I guess, um, places where I, where I would be willing to give in, that's, that's probably more difficult. Um, there's a floor polisher that was on the budget for the facilities. Uh, I'd be happy to give that up so that we had some funding. Um, I don't know, I'm probably looking at some of the capital expenses to see if that's a place where we could, could do, but I don't think that um, it makes any sense to cut any of the, the, teacher, the teachers or the staff because um, we're already short. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sirio. Up next, Dr. Carroll. Thank you for the question. Um, so, you know, it's interesting. I feel almost like a broken record because we've been talking about this in many meetings um, going back to November when we began to outline the FY25 budget. Um, the non-negotiables, uh, the top priority needs that we have include uh, teachers at Pierce Elementary School to address the overcrowding, severe overcrowding that we have there, but that we also anticipate with the extra large upcoming sixth grade class if we don't figure out how to uh, get those additional teachers at Pierce, we are going to end up with unmanageably large class sizes and we're working to avoid that. Um, the next priority would be a reading interventionist for fourth and fifth grade. These are students who were in kindergarten and first grade during the pandemic and they have received reading intervention over the past couple of years due to positions that we have added to support that. 
Um, they now need to continue those intervention supports into fourth and fifth grade. Um, it doesn't make sense to have been providing the support and then to just cut it off. So that is what we are um, still talking about needing. Uh, the adjustment counselors as well, we are so under ratio here, or over ratio rather, in terms of um, having too many students for every one of our adjustment counselors. And we're still working on that because we know that our students' mental health and social emotional well-being is really important. So those are some of the things that we have been working towards. Um, and you know, we're not giving up, we're thinking outside the box, and that's part of our job. Thank you. Up next, Mr. O'Neill. Could you repeat the question for me? Yeah, of course. Given that, due to the town being sued over zoning, the school committee has a smaller budget to work with this year, or sorry, next year. What are some non-negotiables for you in terms of funding? What are some areas you would be willing to compromise on? Okay. Well, being sued over zoning, um, that's, a, that's a whole another issue. Um, but it does affect the school department, so uh, hopefully there's a resolution uh, that is uh, uh, made be between the state and, and the town to, to, as a compromise too. So I would say the non-negotiables are the programs that have been measured to be successful for those that are in need. What do I mean by that? Data-driven um, measurables that, are, are, that, that, that can actually be tangible reading scores, math scores of people, uh, the students that are enrolled in, in, in special ed programs. You, you, you got to start doing the math on, on, on the data to, to make sure that you know what your funding is working. We don't have that here in Milton, unfortunately, because we're run by educators that don't have that financial experience. That's, the, that's what I would bring to this board. Um, every, everything is negotiable, but in, in terms of getting the funding to the right students, uh, hiring the, the, the right um, uh, teachers and uh, behavioralists and interventionalists is, is, is a budget issue. It is one that has been sorely lacking here in foresight on the school committee. And w with my experience, that's not going to be uh, an issue anymore. So thank you for that question. Thank you. We will now hear closing statements from our candidates, chosen at random. Each candidate will have 60 seconds. First is Mr. O'Neill, followed by Dr. Carol, Carol, and we will end with Ms. Syria. Mr. O'Neill, you may begin. Thank you very much, and uh, I appreciate this forum. Thanks to the panelists. Fantastic questions. Uh, thanks to my fellow candidates. I think it's been uh, a, a, a fantastic forum here tonight. Um, I ask for your vote uh, to change this board, to change the makeup of this board. Um, we've got to get away from educational professionals, uh, teachers that are on this board, nonprofit uh, professionals that are on this board, because they don't bring the financial experience and, and critique of the budget. I do. You have a clear choice here in this election. You can go with, with the same old candidates that are elected that have big ideas but no idea how to pay for them. I have the ability to pay for those dreams because I'll be the one that will make the tough choices in the end for the benefit of our children and the benefit of our town. So I humbly ask for your vote on April 30th. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. And now, Dr. Carroll. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you for this great conversation tonight. Um, so since 2021, Milton has elected six new school committee members, um, and we've really benefited. I'm one of them. We've benefited from fresh ideas and diverse skill sets and perspectives. We do have a school committee member who manages a $50 million budget, um, and we have a variety of other expertise. Um, we have welcomed our new superintendent who's building a strong new leadership team around him. So we have these right elements in place, and we have, as I mentioned before, we have the roadmap. We just have to stay focused on moving forward. 
So I will bring my experience to the table, including back to the bargaining table, as we once again bargain our union contracts next year with no one else on the school committee or in central office who will have participated in that process for Milton Public Schools before. I have done that. I believe in my heart that we can fulfill our promise to give every child in Milton the opportunity to thrive in school. And what I represent is proven leadership and a commitment to ensuring we follow through on that. So I ask for your vote uh, because I am ready to keep working on behalf of all of our kids. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Carroll. And now, Ms. Sirio. Thank you as well. I, I, this was a great conversation and I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I hope as you've gathered from my statements, um, I'm passionate about inclusion. Um, I believe it's important for all of our students to feel academically challenged and supported emotionally so that they are happy and productive members of our community and that they leave the Milton schools feeling successful. Um, this requires curriculum that addresses needs of all students and a school system that recognizes and supports their differences and a budget that can ensure that we meet those needs. Um, I'm often teased by my friends for talking about inclusion, but I do it because I believe it's so important. It's important in our schools and it's important in our community and it's something that we need to consistently keep in mind. So when you vote for Amanda Serio on April 30th, um, I hope you know that you are voting for inclusion to the greatest degree possible for all students. Thank you. Thank you to all of our school committee candidates and good luck on April 30th. Audience, please stay tuned while we set up for the Park Commissioner candidates. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I am Tucker Cormand, and I will be your moderator for the Parts Commissioner. The candidates to my left are Mr. Michael Vaughn and Mr. Robert Levash. Beginning with Mr. Vaughn, I have a prepared statement from him. My name is Mike Vaughn. I am a longtime Miltonite. Um, he's a, he and his wife Nancy have three children and he attended the Milton Public Schools, graduated from Milton High in 1989 and from Curry College in 1993 with a BA in Business Management. Professionally, he is the owner of a small customs brokerage and logistics firm in Boston. He is running for the open seat of Park Commissioner because he loves our town and wants to see improvements to the parks so all members of our town can enjoy. Welcome Mr. Vaughn, you may read your opening statement. Good evening. Uh, thank you to the Milton Access TV, to the panelists, and uh, the Milton High School debate team. Unbelievable, very impressive. Go Wildcats. Uh, my name is Michael Vaughn. I'm a lifelong Miltonite. I married Nancy White, class of 1990, also a Miltonite. I uh, went to the high school. We have three children. Uh, my, my passion is the parks and recreation. I want to get involved. I have the time, and I can make the meetings, be committed and I would like to see our parks become better. Uh, we do have a need for fields. We need an increased fields. I would like to see Guile Road turn into a field, not a parking lot. I want this field to uh, be uh, a place where we'll have an awesome complex. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now Mr. Levash. Rob <coughs> Levash is an architect and partner at Wilson Butler Architects in Boston. He's lived in Milton the last 16 years with his wife, Jamie, and two daughters. He's an active coach and serves on Milton's executive softball board. M Welcome, Mr. Levash. You may read your opening statement. First of all, thank you, Milton Access TV and the panelists and the, and the Milton High School debate team, as well as Elaine from Milton Times, uh, for holding this forum for all candidates. My family has called Milton home for the last 16 years, and we're proud to be active and engaged members of the community. I currently serve on Milton Softball Executive Board and as a town meeting member in Precinct 10. Two years ago, I chaired the inaugural Community Preservation Committee, which is responsible for allocating state and municipal funds for community housing, historic preservation, and open space and recreation projects in Milton. My wife, Jamie, is a, libra is a library trustee, a member of the Milton Youth Task Force, a president of Milton Soccer, and a town meeting member as well. Our daughters, Gabby, 12, uh, attends Pierce Middle School, and my youngest, uh, Reese, is eight and attends Collicott. Both participate in many parks and recreational activities, whether it's the summer camps, a, you know, an egg hunt, or even uh, just skiing up at the Blue Hills. Through these experiences, I've gained firsthand knowledge of existing community resources and opportunities for growth and improvement. 
In my role as chair of the Community Preservation Committee, I worked closely with town leadership to invest over $600,000 of open space and recreational projects. Last year, as a member of Milton Softball Board, I spearheaded a successful grant application for Kelly Field dugouts for Babe Ruth and Milton Softball. This project, if approved at town meeting in May, will begin this late summer. I'm proud to call Milton home. I'm excited for the opportunity to serve as town to serve the town as Parks Commissioner, and I ask for your support and vote on April 30th. Thank you both. Now let's begin the forum. The first question will be from Mr. Kevin Gomes and will be first for Mr. Vaughn. Thank you. What specific conservation efforts do you see as a priority in Milton? What specific conservation uh, efforts? Well, yeah. efforts. So uh, I do feel our parks do need uh, to be cleansed. There's a lot of um, waste that we see a lot of people going into the parks, they bring their pets. I'm a, I'm a pet lover myself, but a lot of people do not uh, pick up after their waste. Uh, it's very uh, upsetting to see when you're out in the field and you have little ones, they're running around and they step in some stuff. Uh, it, it's gotta get picked up, it's gotta get cleaned. Uh, that's number one. Number two is, I would like to, uh, again, go back to the Guile field. I'd like to see the lower field uh, get completed. I would like to see a turf be built and uh, I don't have all the expertise on uh, the, 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 the um, building process, but I would surround myself with consultants that have done it and have do, uh, that completed on a collegiate level. Thank you very much, Mr. Vaughn. Mr. Levash. Yeah, so um, I'm just gonna speak specifically about one of the projects I worked on um, for the CPC, um, and specifically just looking at our sustainability um, projects for, for the field. So outside at Middle Guile Field right now, we're replacing our metal halide light fixtures with LED light fixtures. That's cost our sports teams thousands of dollars. Our Milton softball team spends thousands of dollars. The baseball team spends thousands of dollars. And our town spends thousands of dollars on uh, the basketball courts as well. So we're not only gonna be able to save a lot of money, we're also gonna be able to provide more access to, to uh, more games. And the kids just love playing in night games and love playing under the lights. So I'm particularly excited by that project. Um, so that's just one example that, that I'd like to continue to see more sustainability measures in our existing parks and, and continue on that success. Thanks. Thank you. The next question will be from Ms. Carroll and will be first for Mr. Levash. How can Parks and Recreation grow their programs and collaborate better with Milton Youth Sports Leagues? So um, this is something that I'm really passionate about. This is one of the reasons why I wanna, want to be elected uh, for a Parks, uh, parks Commissioner. Um, I've, what I've seen just being on, on Milton softball itself is so many of our sports teams are in silos. And you know, when I was a kid in, in youth sports, we, most things were run through the town, was run through the town, and there was a little bit more oversight. So what I'd like to do is create a town master plan, a recreational town master plan, and really kind of collaborate with all the sports teams. Um, I've already been in contact with a lot of the sports teams. Um, it's helpful that my wife is president of Milton Soccer, so um, you know, we have softball and soccer, but I've been in touch with lacrosse, I've been in touch with, um, you know, football and cheerleading. Um, I would like to reach out to all the sports teams, as including the high school teams as well. But I also think it's important to uh, reach out to our to the youth and teenagers as well and get them involved in the process. So I see a 10-year master plan for for the for us to do that. Um, and you know, I think that'd be great to really collaborate with everyone in town on that master plan. Thank you, Mr. Vaughn. Well, my involvement in Milton Athletics. Uh, using these fields has been on a wide range, not only as a player, a coach, a member of the Milton Board of Directors for the hockey, also a Milton High School booster, but most importantly as a fan. Uh, going to fields and rinks at away games, uh, I often ask why can't Milton have a field like this? Uh, the big need in our town is field space and the dream sheet would be a recreation center. Having those and fostering through the youth program will have the high school students go down and be with the young uh, youth programs. It all has uh, a winning way. When you see the Milton High School football team going down and you see all the kids at the, the, uh, the Milton um, uh, Youth Football League and they get all excited, it, it, it's important. 
Thank you very much. Our final question will be from Ms. Sydney Burns and will be first for Mr. Vaughn. The wooded areas in Cunningham Park have become a hub for illicit activities, notably underage drinking. How would you, as Commissioner, collaborate with the Cunningham Foundation to address the safety of both park goers and the parks themselves? Uh, the, well, as, as a person who grew up in this town, uh, I know of the woods and, and what the woods had. Um, it's, a meeting, it's a meeting place. Uh, but what people have to keep in mind is we must stay in our lanes. So parents have to parent, teachers have to teach, the Parks and Recs Department could assist, but it all goes back to the parents. If the parents see something, they must say something. And that's what I would do, stay in your lane. Thank you. And Mr. Levash. Yeah, so um, I, I actually agree with Mike. Um, you know, parents do need, need to watch over their children, but I also think we need to find activities for our teenagers. I just don't think there's enough activities for our teenagers. Um, and you know, my wife being on the youth task force with other teenagers in town um, has really given me insight on the lack of activities for teenagers. So I think collaboration with the youth task force is really important for the Parks Commission as well. We need to listen to the teenagers themselves and, and hear what they would like to do. You know, I, I've talked to with Rachel Plazar, who's the chair of the youth task force, um, and some ideas were, you know, to create volleyball courts in, in town. So I think that kind of um, goes back to the master plan. I think there's so many interests in town and there, our fields are so limited that we really need to look at our existing fields and to figure out a long-term plan so that everyone's interests are, you know, come to bear and, and, and we can kind of figure out what we want to do and ex to expand programming. Um, I think my experience on the CPC really kind of gives me um, an insight on how to, we can raise funding. Our, our budget in the parks is very limited. So I think we also need to leverage private funding as well. Private funding is important too. So I think you, you combine all that and we can expand uh, opportunities for all ages and really all abilities as well. I think it's really important. Thank you both. We will now hear closing statements from both of our candidates, once more chosen at random. Each candidate will have 60 seconds. First is Mr. Levash, followed by Mr. Vaughn. Mr. Levash, you may begin. Uh, first of all, thank, thank you panel for some excellent questions. Um, and so the Milton Parks and Recreation are wonderful. They're among the many reasons my family and I chose to move to this town. Although I believe the Milton Parks and Recreation are amazing, I believe that they can be even better. In fact, I've already been putting in the work. I've chaired the CPC. I serve at leadership roles in town athletics. I received the endorsement of four parks commissioners and I've identified potential collaborators and have a plan in place that will allow me to hit the ground running my, once again, my name's Rob Liebash, and I will work incredibly hard for you and your families, and, I'm, and I'll humbly ask for your support on April 30th. Thank you very much. Finally, Mr. Vaughn. Well, thank you to the panel. Uh, Rob, thank you. It's been fun. Uh, I, I just want to say my, my um, ability to commit to regular board meetings, uh, my flexibility to take on additional responsibilities within reason, being a park commissioner is a volunteer spot. I'm excited to contribute and try and enhance our outdoor spaces for all in our town. I have a passion for the parks and recreation. Growing up in Milton, playing on these fields, coaching on these fields, I had an outstanding experience. I want the next generation to have that same feel and I have not run for a town-wide position in over 25 years. I'm committed to being your next park commissioner Please consider voting for Mike Vaughn, April 30th. Thank you. Thank you once again to all of our Park Commissioner candidates, and good luck to both of you on April 30th. To our audience, please stay tuned while we set up for the Planning Board candidates our final forum of the evening. Hello, I am Kevin Gomes and will be your moderator for the Planning Board Forum. We would now like to introduce the planning board candidates, incumbent Ms. Meredith Hall and candidate Matt Morong. First, welcome to Ms. Hall. I will read her bio. Meredith Hall has lived in Milton for 30 years with her husband, David, where they have raised three children, Kendall, Parker, and Lizzie. Meredith has a BS, a business in my, from Miami University in Ohio, and is an active real estate agent and has served on many Milton boards 
and committees, including the planning board currently serving as the chair, the Historic Commission, Milton Guard Club, Cunningham Park Foundation Board, CPA Study Committee, Town Meeting Member, Village School Board, Glover School PTO, Milton Public Schools MPACE Committee, and Historic New England's Outreach Committee. Meredith's goal is to maintain the character of Milton while improving the quality of life for its residents. Welcome, Ms. Hall. You may now read your opening statement. Great, thank you. Good evening, and thank you to those watch watching this evening and for Milton Access to be hosting tonight's debate and, and the Milton High School debate team in Milton Times, of course. With thoughtful yet welcoming concepts, Milton can continue to be an exemplar of town planning. Milton needs to address total needs as it increases its population and opportunities. Infrastructure, fire, police, and schools are just a few of the areas that need to be considered with a growing population. Having extensive experience working in and volunteering for organizations on behalf of Milton, I believe I would bring a unique perspective and understanding to planning for Milton. As a real estate professional, I have the skills to identify housing supply, demand, and trends, as well as land opportunities that would enab enable us to thoughtfully and proactively plan for affordable housing and reach our 10% goal. In adhering to Milton, Milton's master plan, I seek opportunities for historic preservation, preservation of open spaces, and high quality affordable housing. It is my goal to maintain the character of Milton while improving the quality of life for our residents. I see the passing of the Community Preservation Act as a great opportunity to continue to fund our most essential projects. I believe most importantly in listening to our residents and in approaching planning with a thoughtful process that is transparent and provides an opportunity for all voices to be heard. I look forward to discussing these issues this evening. Thank you, Ms. Hall. Next, we have Mr. Morong. I will read his bio. Matt Morong is a proud father of a Glover first grader, a member of the Milton School Facilities Advisory Committee, an architect with over 220 years of experience, and a national leader in design for transportation, rail, and transit. Welcome, Mr. Morong. You may now read your opening statement. All right, thank you, um, and good evening. Good evening, panel. Um, good evening, everybody at home. Uh, my name is Matt Morong. Um, I'm an architect with 20 years of experience um, and a background in planning. Um, I'm a specialist in transit and transportation. Projects that you might be familiar with are the redesign of Wollaston Station, which for a long time was the only non-accessible red line stop on the MBTA, um, and Terminal E at Logan Airport, which is the big red blob that you see when you drive in. Um, I'm a lead accredited professional, which means that I'm credentialed in understanding how to create green buildings. I'm a member of the Milton School Facilities Committee, and most importantly, the father of Addie, a Glover first grader. I'm running because I think the planning board has flown under the radar in recent years, but is needed now more than ever uh, due to recent events if impacting our town. If you're stuck in traffic, if you can't get a cup of coffee, if the cost of housing is too high, these are all issues that the planning board can fix. I hope to leverage my experience, but more than anything, I hope to listen to all sides. I have a track record of this. The nature of my work requires constant feedback from the public and considering their, their opinions as I do my work. I ask for your vote on April 30th. Thank you. Ms. Morong, now let's speak in the forum. The first question will be from Ms. Burns and will be for Ms. Hall. Thank you. D do you think that the population growth in Milton Public Schools warrants new zonings? New zoning, are you are the changes worth disrupting protected land? So um, my approach to planning and I think the way our board currently works is you you look you seek a balance. You um, you absolutely I believe you can do both. I believe you can um, continue with thoughtful planning to create more housing. I think that's a really important issue right now in our state that we're facing, is how to increase that housing. Um, we are doing, um, we're doing some really creative things with, with creating housing overlay districts, um, looking at um, what we have in the pipeline. Um, not only do we have curtain construction, multifamily housing projects um, in Milton under construction, but we have to look at our housing production plan and really look into the future to say, we know we have 40 Bs coming you know, down the road at some point, we don't know exactly when. We have um, 
um, condominiums that are either just coming on market, such as the Hendry's building. We have um, soon the start of 440 Granite that's going to be starting, which will also be condo units. Um, so we, we know we have a lot of housing that will be coming online. And so how we thoughtfully plan for that, but we address uh, the needs for the schools, um, I believe we can do that without disrupting our open space and protecting that while accommodating um, our growing population with kids. Thank you, Ms. Hall. Mr. Morong, you have the floor. Okay, um, thank you. I think, um, I think that this is an issue worth considering very carefully. I think that growth should occur um, because I think that given the market forces that are pressuring Milton, we've seen prices skyrocket out of control for housing here. But I think that that growth has to be done very sensitively and very carefully. Um, so that means pinpointing specific places where growth can happen. Um, and I think that building on the existing fabric that we have here, we have that to some extent already. I think amplifying that in those areas is a way to go and, and an intelligent way to go about it. I do think that protected land in particular in this town and open space in general is, at a, it's, it's, it's very rare, um, it's very precious. And so to the greatest extent, oh actually, I shouldn't say to the greatest extent possible, I should say absolutely, I think protected land should re remain protected. Thank you, Mr. Morong. The next question will be from Ms. Elaine Carroll and will be the it will be first for Mr. Morong. How would you as a planning board member act to boost the vitality of the town's commercial areas, including East Milton? So I think that also has to be done very carefully um, and with careful consideration. I think that we're really fortunate to have the small commercial areas that we already have. In East Milton, I live right next to um, the Central Ave Business District, and it's, it's the reason why I moved here, right? It's, it's the ability to walk to restaurants, it's the ability to get a coffee, that sort of thing. Um, I think that you know, the, the planning board should, should look to, to expand those opportunities very carefully, but also do it sensitively. I think that there is a lot of hesitation specifically about traffic and other impacts that, you know, that are side effects of, of growth that need to be addressed before we can take steps and, and build faith in, in the townspeople in those areas. So I, I think we not only have to do things like traffic studies, I think we have to act on them. I think that we need to, to take, take, give people something uh, to believe that, that these issues are not going to balloon into bigger and bigger problems. I also think that looking at other parts of town and seeing where we can selectively insert other little, little pieces of community-based you know, retail and things like that would also be really helpful because I think that right now everything is, is focused on a few very, very small areas, but I think that there are other parts of town that are, that are dying for, for the ability to walk to a cup of coffee or that sort of thing. So um, I'm really into coffee, so that's, that's, what I'm, um, that's what I would support. Thank you, Mr. Morong. Ms. Hall, you have the floor. Thank you. So what are two things that we've been doing, um, the first is overlay, doing overlay zoning. Um, we initially did an overlay zoning in the Lower Mills Village area, which allows for mixed use. Um, so residential, now what has been typically zoned 100% commercial, now we'll have the opportunity to have first floor retail commercial, but allowing residents to live above, which will in essence revitalize that area because people can walk to their shops, walk to get coffee, walk to the restaurants, um, which is really wonderful. We, um, when I came on, we worked on design guidelines for that to really make it fit in and make that uh, concept work. Now we are currently do, um, doing overlay zoning. We're in the early stages in East Milton, which, um, which will be critical that we, that we look at that. Um, listening to the residents, we're doing public forums because it's really important to get the input from the residents on height, on you know, density, on what their, what their vision is and how it remains a village and doesn't feel like a, an urban city. Um, so we are, we are currently also working on that. The other thing that's really important is in the MBTA community zoning that we're doing, you are only allowed to put 25% in, of all of your zoning um, in, in certain districts. So we have to weigh that, um, and that's one of the questions. Do we, do we put that uh, zoning, do we make it commercial just in the Milton Village area, or do we, or do we actually consider that for uh, East Milton so we don't um, lose our, our, our vital um, commercial zoning? Thank you, Ms. Hall. Thank you. The next question will be from Mr. Bodwin and will be first for Ms. Hall. If you were to be elected to the planning board, how do you propose the town tackle the new MBTA zoning requirements? 
Good, thank you very much. Um, so that is something that we've, we're, we've already begun um, to continue working on. Um, we are in the process of bringing on, um, having a new contract with our, our new consultant who will help us with the technical work on that. One of the th aspects, um, there's, there's a few things that, um, that we would like to um, improve on what was the previous zoning. Um, the first item is, um, is the increase in affordability uh, component. That would require a fiscal um, and economic feasibility study, which we would have a consultant do, which would rather than just limiting us to an up to 10% amount of affordable housing and new developments, we could actually ask a developer to do 15%. So that would actually help us to get ahead in our affordable housing numbers. Um, the, other, the other piece that we are um, really looking at is the districts. Obviously, um, East Milton was very concerned about b uh, there being zoning for 1,100 units in that area. We need to go back, we need to look at those districts, but what we really need to do is listen to the residents of Milton and get their input. Um, we want this to be a very transparent process, so we are coming up with a new survey that residents can fill out. A lot of people didn't even know that this zoning was happening, the MBTA zoning, until it was really late in the process. So we want to make sure that we are being proactive to um, solicit input on that, um, in, that, um, in that work we do. Thank you, Ms. Hall. Mr. Morong, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, I agree with almost everything that Meredith has said here. Um, I do think that, in particular, the, the work toward compromise and, and the work toward consensus on the MBTA Communities Act is really important. Um, I think that you know this is an issue that has been really divisive in the town over the past year or so. Um, and, it, and it's something that I think that we really have to work together to move forward on. So I think going into different neighborhoods, not, not just those that are impacted by the zoning, but all over the town um, to, to talk to people, to get their input, and to, to really have the most robust public process that we possibly can, I think is really, really essential here. I would also push the urgency of this a little bit. You know, um, I, I do think there's been a lot of talk about devising the best plan possible. And I think that it's really important that we get to work on it. And I think that we need to plan this out from a project managerial point of view, have clear deadlines um, so that we get over the finish line. The planning board promised that we would have an article in, in hands of the town for Springtown meeting on MBTA communities this year. And um, you know, it's, it hasn't happened. Um, and, but I do think that the first order of business here is, is getting, getting it right. And so I think that we should pull people together talk about it as a town, and, and set, set a deadline for getting us an answer. Thank you. The next question will be from Ms. Burns, and will be first for Mr. Morong. Thank you. Do you believe that carbon emissions should be a primary concern of the planning board? Do you have any proposed projects or methods that would help reduce the carbon footprint of the town? I think this is enormously important. Um, I think that planning can actually have a, a massive impact on the carbon emissions of the town. Um, there, was a, there was actually a map put out by the New York Times about two years ago um, that showed the carbon emissions of different communities. And it was really interesting to see how Boston compared to Milton, which butted up right against us. And the fact that the, the way that we're structured as a town requires people to drive places. It, it requires, with, with single family houses, you're, you're, not, you're not as efficient. And so the end result is that Milton burns a lot of carbon. Um, so that's something to consider, that the way that we live has a huge impact on that. And when you can reduce things, uh, reduce car trips, when you can use public transit, when you, when you build around those sorts of things, that has a massive impact on our, our community's carbon output. So I would greatly support strategies to continue that, and also strategies within individual buildings as well. You know, there, there are questions in front of the town right now about how we structure our energy codes um, and, and whether or not to go, you know, to, to work um, for, toward electrification or making buildings electrification ready. Um, I, I think that, you know, this is an interesting question and something that we should push in order to reduce our carbon input, make us able to rely on as many renewable resources as possible. Thank you, Mr. Wrong. Ms. Hall, you have the floor. Thank you. So this is one aspect of the of, of also the MBTA zoning that um, that I would like to touch on because a lot of people's concern was that the intent of the law 
is for this to be sustainable, for people to walk, actually walk um, and be able to take public transportation without having to get in their cars and drive. So one of the concerns was some of the zoning that was being put in, for example, in East Milton Square, people were saying, you know, this really is not going to be a, a good sustainable um, means of, of creating districts here because people really won't have easy access to a train. So that is an important part of the MBTA zoning that we, we do want that to be, um, for the folks to be accessible to public transportation. The second thing is, um, uh, what Matt touched on is there's a new stretch code that's going to be proposed. It's going to be before town meeting in May. Um, it'll be a town meeting decision. And that is expanding on what is currently um, a stretch code that we already have in place in Milton. It will actually, um, any, any property, any um, buildings over 4,000 square feet will be required to be electric or that they will have to have solar or, um, and they will have to, um, if they choose to be, remain gas or oil, they will actually have to wire for, um, for electric to be, um, to be more sustainable. So the town will have to make that decision as well, but that is something, um, and we have a recent 440 grant, it will be an all electric building. So um, that will be the future, probably of multifamily housing. Thank you. Thank you. The next question will be from Mr. Corman. It will be first for Ms. Hall. Thank you. In a general sense, what do you think are the most pressing zoning issues Milton faces, and what would be the consequences of failing to address them today? So the, I would say the biggest issue is um, because Milton is such a desirable town, um, it's an old historic town. So most of, most of the town was built out before we even had zoning. So we're working with areas that we're trying to create overlay zoning or improve um, diversity of, of housing, but in areas that are already built out and we don't necessarily have the open space, um, we don't have large tracts of land here. So we're having to look at existing buildings and I've always thought, the greenest building is a building that already exists. If we can reuse and repurpose a building, it's wonderful. But that is, um, in essence, one of our challenges is that we, we are really limited in land. And obviously, we're trying to build a new school. That Just to find that um, is, is really um, a challenge in many times. And, and that's something I would like to really work with the select board on, is being proactive when there are opportunities um, to purchase and acquire land. There have been many, many properties that have come up. Um, Coulter Landscape, for example, on Blue Hill Ave was a great site, um, but at the time we didn't have CPA funding, so we didn't have funding to acquire open space. So now with the, with the CPC funding, we can actually go out, we can be proactive as a town, we can acquire areas for parking, whether it's in East Milton Square, and future, um, and be a little more, more strategic and proactive in our um, ability to, to locate land to develop. Thank you, Ms. Hall. Mr. Morong, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. Um, I would say that the most pressing zoning issue in the town is the MBTA Communities Act and, and how we respond to it. I think that this is a big question and an important question that changes how we will think of ourselves as a town um, and how we, how we choose to develop. Um, but I, 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 it's a hard process, but I look forward to it because it is an opportunity to build consensus here. Um, I think that you know vo different voices have been heard and it's been divisive, but at the same time, I think this is a chance for Milton to come together and think about what it wants to be as we move ahead into the future. Um, so I think that that is, that is probably the biggest issue um, that will have a massive impact on, on the shaping of Milton into the future. Thank you. The next question will be from Ms. Elaine Carroll and will be first for Mr. Morong. What specific alternatives to the 40B developments do you see to help the, to help the town reach its mandated affordable housing goals? So I think you know, the, the way to get out of 40B is to develop affordable housing. Um, and so I think that that's, that's something that we need to, to focus on as a town and something that we haven't in the past. Um, I think the ways to do this, I think the MBTA Communities Act and the, the associated affordable housing component that Meredith mentioned is, is one way to start to chip away at that. 
Um, but I also think that you know, as as we develop more in this town, you know, pay either either mandating more affordable housing as a component of that, um, and for smaller developments, paying into a fund that will ultimately build more affordable housing um, is is the best approach for that sort of thing. So that over time, I mean, at the end of the day, the goal is to provide you know a, a subsidized affordable housing. I also think you know that we can't forget that by increasing. Um, the, you know, the, one of the goals of the MBTA Communities Act, which is a region-wide problem, but that we should we should participate in, is also making housing more affordable in by market rate housing. And so, by increasing supply, um, it will reduce the pri the upward pressure on housing prices. And and I think that that's also important across the board. Thank you, Ms. Hall. You have the floor. Great. Thank you. So I think um, I would say there's five things that we can do. Um, one of which, one of the first things um, that we were able to do on the planning board when I came on was to, um, to there was a project, a Winter Valley um, expansion project that we were able to approve. So there are 36 units that will be coming online. They're currently in the process of getting their grant funding. But that approval and expanding on on a community which is already 100% affordable housing, we know that every unit will, that's added, those 36 units will be 100% affordable housing. The, um, the second thing that we, um, that we are doing also is the improvement to the, um, to the MBTA zoning, increasing that to a 15%, a 15 percent, um, which I think after we do an economic feasibility study, I think is very realistic. Um, other towns like Newton have been able to get a 15% number. Some are even thinking 17%, we could increase that number. Um, the third thing is when a project, um, for example, Walcott Woods, when they can't put affordable housing for some reason on that site, we can require them to purchase um, off-site housing. Um, and we're seeing many projects that do that, that they will buy a two-family, um, refurbish those, and then those are put into the lottery system. And then the last thing, um, again, if a developer for some reason um, does not have the capacity to put affordable housing on a site, that they put money into, a, into the um, a trust into the affordable housing trust so that the affordable housing trust can fund projects such as um, what we're seeing um, at po possibly Governor Stoughton, um, which would be a reuse of the reuse of the of the property um, and putting affordable housing in there. Thank you. The last question will be for Mr. Corman. It will be first for Ms. Hall. What types of developments do you think the planning board should be prioritized going into the future? Are there any types of developments you see as over or underemphasized? So we look at all different types of projects. Um, we are, you know, we as as we're working, we're trying to be proactive in our planning. Um, that's why we're doing some overlay zoning um, with really good design guidelines, with height setbacks, you know, really um, carefully thoughtful zoning. Um, but we have, there's a variety of needs. We right now have, um, we're in the process of getting close to um, a decision on 111 Highland Street, which is a memory care facility, which is a tremendous need for the town. Um, people with elder, um, you know, family members um, with memory loss often have to travel to Brookline or, you know, half an hour and go for, you know, pick them up for Thanksgiving dinner, bring them home, and then take them back to the facility. If we could have something, um, and we're, we're really working on that because it's, um, it's a complicated site because there's a lot of wetlands. Um, but um, so we, we look at a variety of different um, projects. But I would say right now um, managing um, housing, um, appropriate housing, um, without um, putting too much impact onto our school systems and other resources in town. Um, is, is, uh, is something that we're looking at. Thank you. Mr. Morong, you have the floor. Um, I, I think Milton needs to look at what's, what's often called missing middle housing. Um, you know, I think that we offer a lot of single family homes and there are tons of options on that front. Um, but in terms of other more modest dwellings, you know, there, there aren't as many opportunities for that. And that's an, that, those represent an opportunity to buy into the housing market. Also, later on in your life, it gives you an opportunity to, to downsize. And so I think that's something that we're, we're, there's definitely a shortage of in this town. Um, and, and I think that what it represents um, in terms of livability and affordability is really important. It's also worth noting that, you know, those types of housing um, often, often come with greater density. They can support more local retail, 
um, and, and more density um, within those neighborhoods. And so it, it makes places more walkable. It makes uh, businesses able to you know, have, a, have a wider customer base in those areas and, and thrive in those neighborhoods. And so that's another type of housing that I think Milton should, should consider. Um, it's, it's, there's definitely a shortage of it here um, and, and something that I would like to see more of. Thank you, candidates. We will now hear the closing statements from our candidates, chosen at random. Each candidate will have 60 seconds. First is Mr. Morong, followed by Ms. Hall. Thank you. Um, architecture and planning are acts of optimism. Um, they require a belief that we can change the way that we live uh, through problem solving and design. Uh, involvement in local government is also an act of optimism. It's a belief that we can make the place we live better through working things out democratically. Over the past few years, the planning board has felt like it's stuck. I hope to use my skill set as a listener and as a problem solver to make the planning board work for Milton. The people of Milton deserve a planning board that functions as it should. But more than this, they deserve a planning board that can listen and find common ground. I bring this uncommon blend of design skill with a proven track record of listening to and acting on feedback. I thank you all for, for listening, and I ask for your support on April 30th. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Morong. And now, Ms. Hall. Thank you. Uh, thank you again for the invitation to speak with you tonight and for the panel. Um, for those of you who know me, I have a proven record for preserving and protecting the assets of the town. I am passionate about the opportunities to improve and revitalize our business districts in a way that is appropriate for Milton and brings your ideas to the table. I will continue, and I will continue to protect our town's zoning while always looking for ways to improve and update when needed. I believe that listening to our residents and creating an inclusive and transparent process is essential. And I believe with a fresh focus on thoughtful planning for affordable housing, I will move us towards our goal of 10%. I believe when Milton has been successful, whether building new schools, our library, and now fire stations, it is because we have come together and worked together as a town. Again, I am grateful for this opportunity and remain deeply committed to the town of Milton. It would be a great honor to serve as a member of the, continue to serve as a member of the Milton Planning Board. Thank you for your consideration of your vote on April 30th. And uh, you can go to my website if you'd like more information, meredith4milton.com. Thank you. Thank you, candidates. And that concludes our planning board forum as well as our evening. Thank you to all candidates for participating in tonight's forum. Thank you to Ms. Carroll and the Milton High School debate team for their excellently thought out questions and being with us tonight. And finally, thank you to the staff of MATV, Tom Pilla, Ted Omo, Sean Doyle, Jason Flanagan, who are under the direction of Shan Brandenburg. I'd like to remind everyone that the annual town election is scheduled for April 30th. Tune in to Comcast Channel 8 on Tuesday, April 30th at 8 p.m. for live election results. Thank you again to all the candidates for participating tonight, and thank you to the viewers at home for watching. Have a pleasant evening.